Well, hi, and, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us here today. Um, very excited to, uh, to, to be part of uh, the latest uh, edition of the ongoing uh, 2021 Cubby Lecture Series. My name is Dan Dakin. I'll be your moderator this afternoon, um, filling in for my, my colleague, Sarah Ackles. Uh, the lecture uh, today will run uh, somewhere in the area of uh, 45 minutes or a little bit less, and then we'll have a question and answer period um, after that. So um, please feel free to type your questions into the chat feature here in Life Size, and, uh, and then we'll share them at the end. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome today uh, Annette Nasuth, who is our speaker. Uh, Dr. Nasuth is a Covey Fellow uh, and Associate Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology at the University of Guelph. She received her PhD from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and held postdoc positions at the Max Plant uh, Institute in Munich uh, and then the University of Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Nasuth has worked on plants such as tobacco, tomato, wheat, and of course, grapes. And while her research initially focused on plant viruses uh, um, in these, uh, these particular plants, um, it shifted about 20 years ago to an investigation into the molecular uh, basis of cold acclimation of grapes. Um, so today, Dr. Nasuth is going to share her latest research in a lecture titled Grapeling with Low Temperatures, which is a pun I can appreciate. So with that, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Nasuth to please share her screen and go ahead with her presentation. Thank you. Okay, I want first to say uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining. I will now share my uh, presentation. So I hope you can all see it. Uh, so welcome. Uh, the presentation I uh, call that crippling with low temperatures because not only the grapes, but also I have been rambling this uh, with how the plants can react to low temperatures and how they can deal with it. I will first talk a little bit about the importance of cold hardiness, although I'm sure you all know that. Then the only effect of the environment and genes on cold hardiness. Then the relation between stomata and cold hardiness. And at the end, I will talk about insights into the evolution of ice protein function. And although that latter topic might be something new for you, uh, I hope you find it exciting when I go into that. Now, as you all know, low temperatures can damage vine grapes. And one of the reasons that that is uh, not so surprising is that the elite vine grapes originate from warmer climates. And you see here a beautiful painting from a tomb of Nacht in uh, about 1300 BC from Egypt. And so in that time already, people were harvesting grapes and making wine from it. Uh, but that is a warmer climate. So when you try to grow it now in, in climates where the winters are more severe, that can be a problem. And so really it is the low temperatures that limit the geographical distribution and performance of vine grapes. Now, winter injury can have, do a lot of damage to the crop and, and uh, there will be countless examples for that. I chose this one because here they calculated exactly how much money that uh, was, uh, was in losses. So that was the winter injury in an event in January 2004 in the Finger Lakes region and that resulted in crop losses of about 5.7 million and estimated loss in wine sales of 41.5 million. So pretty uh, substantial. And the picture that you see here is demonstrating another point as well. You see here that the leaves are, are really damaged and a bit brown and so they will not probably not survive. But it might still be that there is some growth happening there. But the point is that even if the plant or the bud doesn't completely die, it can still lead to substantial losses because the growth might not be very good. And that can stretch out for several years. So that can be uh, uh, damage by, by uh, low temperatures can be felt by the grower for a much longer year, for several years. And so one key question is there, what determines cold hardiness? What makes it a plant can uh, survive certain temperatures, whereas another one cannot? 
Now, this is a picture that is from, to be familiar for you because that is the kind of data that you get from the Vine Alert program from COVID. And what you see here is that in September, the cold hardiness of the buds might be uh, more around minus seven, whereas in January, midwinter, that is now minus 24. And in the spring, you see that it goes up again so that it is closer to zero when you get to April. In other words, the cold hardiness of a bud uh, will change during the seasons. Now, this is a picture from one of the real data. The other one was just a drawing, but this is the real data from 2020 and 2021 season. So that's what we are in now. And you see the same kind of thing. So you see again here this uh, depicted from November uh, till uh, mid uh, uh, March or mid February, and you see that there, that the really during the different months the bud hardiness changes a lot, and you see that that happens for both Riesling and uh, Merlot. So basically, all different, and I just chose these two, but when you look at other cultivars, you will see similar kind of trends. So what that tells me is that plants react to environmental conditions that are are there in the fall. Now you cannot, when there's a, a, a severe winter, it would not be a good thing if this plant suddenly experiences that and didn't prepare for it. So it's really the already cooler temperatures that you have in the fall that make that the plant adapt and that it already prepares to be able to survive the winter. Now here at the top right is again the same picture, but I compared it now with some other pictures. And at the top, that are the data that are from Short Hills Bench, and that is from 2018-19, and then the picture that we saw before, the 2020-21 picture. And what you can see, although the, the um, legend on, on the sides, the range is a little bit different between them, but the key point that I wanted to make is that from year to year, the exact numbers can vary. It's not always the same. And what you see at the top is then Short Hill Bench, but below is Lincoln Lakeshore. And there you see that between different sites, it can differ. So the cold hardiness can be different per month, per year, and per site. In addition, what you see with these four graphs, you see that in all of them, Cultivar Riesling has lower values than the Merlot. In other words, it is much more cold hardy than Merlot. What does that mean? That means that the genes, because these different cultivars have slightly different genes, and these genes, they affect the cold hardiness. And you can see that actually in a more extreme case, when you compare the Vitus riparia on the left with the Vitus vinifera on the right with the vine grape. And the Vitus riparia can uh, we stand in the winter, it can be stand minus 40 degrees, whereas the vinifera maximum that it can withstand would be minus 15 to minus 20 degrees. How is the interaction? How about that? About have they these two things to do with each other? We saw that the environment affects the cold hardiness and genes affect the cold hardiness. So what is uh, what does that mean? How does that uh, come about? Well, in the fall, you get an activation of proteins in what we call the ICBF pathway, which you see depicted here. On the left, you see this ice protein in blue, and that is being activated by a low temperature. And because of that, you get an activation of this CBF protein, which activates these core proteins. Core stands for cold uh, regulated protein. And this core protein now, are doing the job. They make sure that the cells increase their sugar content and also increase in other proteins that help that cell to be able to survive the lower temperatures. In other words, after you go through this cascade, what you get is a cell or plant that is more freezing tolerant. And so that we call that the ICBF pathway because as you see, you have the ice goes to CBF. Now, what was now surprising is that it was discovered that that same ice protein also has a role in the development of stomata. And that you see depicted below. 
So again, you see the blue ice protein, and that is involved in three different steps. There's one, two, three. To, to change an undifferentiated cell, basically a young cell that doesn't, hasn't decided yet what it will become, and because that ice protein is there, together with some other proteins that we won't go into detail about, but that, that makes that it changes what it is. And at the end, it becomes a stoma. And a stoma is nothing more than two cells, actually, that surround an opening here in black. And so if I have a plant that has more activity of that ice protein, I will get more of this happening. So that plant will be more freezing tolerant. And the question that we had was say, okay, if that is happening, what about if I increase the activity of that ice, do I also get more stomata? So the question was, do more cold hardy plants also have more stomata? But before I tell you that, I wanted to tell you first, what are stomata now exactly? Because that might not be a subject of discussion at your dinner table. So stomata are pores on the surfaces of leaves. And you see here a cross section of a leaf. This is a leaf and you see a lot of cells in there. But here you see in blue, you see such different stomata. And what they have is this opening in the middle and that opening is connected to these large airy areas here. And so that surrounds all the different cells in that, uh, in that leaf. And they are there so that they allow the exchange of water and of gases, the CO2 and the oxygen and water. So those openings uh, have a role in that. So now we know what stomata are, we can have a look at that. And so we compare the wild grape, Vitis riparia, because that was much more cold tolerant, to Vitis vinifera, the wine grape. And we looked at that in different leaves. So we count here the leaves. One is the smallest, and then we go up. And actually, we went to leaf 10 in this experiment. That would be a bit too big to fit on this picture. So I only show you here one to five. And what you see here on the left, you see Vitis riparia. And you see in green the size of the leaves. And you see that initially, they don't expand that much. I say relatively small, but then poof, they come and they become much bigger. And the same you see in the Vitis vinifera. Now, when you now look at the stomata that are in there, so this is the percentage of cells that become stomata, you see that that increases while these leaves are developing. But when I'm here at a mature leaf, that stops. So that percentage stays the same. And the same you see here for the Vitis vinifera. What is the difference here is that the end result for the riparia, the wild grape, you see that it has many more stomata compared to what you have in the vinifera. Now, when you expose these plants now to low temperatures, you can see that the number of the uh, stomata increases. That is here in the stippled line. So instead of this solid red line, you go to the stippled line. So it increases again in both cases, both in vitis riparia and vinifera but it does that more in the riparia than it is in the vinifera. So that reaction is similar as an increase in cold tolerance that, that we found in the vitis riparia and the vitis vinifera. So that was for the wild grape and the cultivated grape, but the, that difference in the cold tolerance, you could already see it was minus 40 to minus 25. So that's a big difference between the uh, cultivars will be much smaller. So the question was, can we find similar results when we look at the uh, cultivars? And so here you see actually the picture that we use. This is a picture taken with a scanning electron microscope. That's a microscope that can enlarge uh, the leaf quite a lot. And because of that, you see here these stomata. So this is a, a pretty large one. Here you have a very small one. So you see they have different sizes. And this is what is present in a mature leaf. So there's a leaf that stopped developing. That means that these stomata are at their end stage. So it is not that these stomata are, uh, that these small stomata still have to become bigger. This is their end stage. So we do have small and large stomata. And then we compared now the Riesling in blue with the Merlot in red. 
Riesling is more um, has a better cold hardiness, as we saw, compared to the Merlot. We see that the Riesling has a higher number of stomata. But these stomata are mainly the small. Eh? On this, this axis here, you can see go from very small to bigger. And this is the number. So you see the extra stomata that we have in the Riesling are mainly the small sunken stomata that you see here. Well, you say, what might that be about? Well, it turns out that these small stomata can open and close faster. And just to give you an idea, here you see a stoma that opens and closes. And so you can imagine when it's closed, then that gas exchange cannot happen. Uh, and when it's open, it can. And so if conditions are advantageous, it is good for the plant to open its stomata because then it can have more of that gas exchange. And it turns out that here you see from small to large stomata, you see when they are small, they are much better able to open and close. Whereas when they are large, then that is less, they can do it less. And what does that mean for the plant? Well, here we see again that cross section. So when I can have it open, as soon as the conditions are are fine, then you can get more of that CO2 coming in, that carbon dioxide. And there's a process of photosynthesis that happens that will use that CO2 to create more food for the plant. And when you have more food, you can grow more. And that's what you see here. On the left, you see here the regular plant. And then here are the plants that were made to have more stomata. And you see that they are bigger than this one. So by just making, being able to um, get more of that carbon dioxide in, you can grow more. And so when you have more of these, more stomata, that's advantageous. But then even when they are small, that means that they can quickly react to circumstances and therefore help the plant to grow more. Now, when we are looking at these stomata at different, uh, for different cultivars, different sites, and grafted on different rootstocks. And these were the plants that we took from uh, Chateau de Charmes and Stratus. Here, the results are organized in such a way that at the top is, are the ones that have the most stomata and at the bottom that have the fewest. And what you can see here is that it really uh, regulates that the Riesling seems to be better. It can have more stomata than the Chardonnay and then Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc. More cold tolerant to less cold tolerant. You also see there's an effect of the site because you see that at Chateau de Charmes, the environment was such that they would have more stomata compared to the stratus. And there seemed to be a minor effect on the rootstock that was being used. The 3309 maybe was a bit better than the Repair Clor and SO4. Now, this is just the data from September. We have similar data for other times of the year. And altogether, these results show that the time of season had a significant effect. So July and September, so stomata numbers correlated with bird hardiness. The site has a significant effect, but the rootstock effect was not significant. So when you do statistical analysis, we could not say that it was a significant effect. However, you could also see that the cultivars, in other words, the genes had a significant effect. The more frost tolerant grapes, such as Riesling, had a higher number of small sunken stomata. Now, what is that now to do with that ice? We talked about that ice before, and that is, uh, that is encoded by a gene. Huh? Genes make proteins. Well, it turns out that grapes have four genes four different ice proteins can be made of those. And you see here a pictogram to, to demonstrate that. And what you can see here as well is that three of them, the different colors indicate whether they are have similar areas. And so here all the gray means that they are quite similar. Uh, here the, these extra blocks, the green, the purple, and the dark uh, blue means that those are similar, but the rest of this is not so similar. But the main difference that you can see is that number four, this one, is really quite different from the first three. So the I4 protein is quite different from I2 and 3. Well, why would we care? 
Well, to have more than one gene that encodes a protein, a similar kind of protein, is not uncommon. It happens often during evolution that genes duplicate, as we say, so you make an extra copy, and that extra copy can then evolve to have a different function. And that is the strength of that. And to demonstrate that a bit or illustrate that a bit, I take an example with the evolution of coats. So our human ancestor, they used pelts from the animals that they killed to protect against low temperatures. And that was a good thing. Our human ancestors apparently were not built uh, to withstand lower temperatures very well, in contrast to the Neanderthals who lived at the same time. And so they had no need to make mm, a very good clothing. So their, their clothing was more inferior to protect against low temperatures. But because of that, they also lacked the skill, skills to sew thicker clothes. And so when the temperature changed on Earth, they were not prepared to, to deal with that. And so the, this, our human ancestors, they did because they had already started doing that anyway. So that is how code started. And that had evolved now further is that different uh, people were making cold, uh, cold still against colder temperatures. And here you see a beautiful example of from uh, Inuit people. And you see how beautiful decorated they are as well. And that I assume that's very warm. And what is interesting now that actually was used then by that these decoration is kind of a symbol of identity. And a different uh, groups of people used to do that already. You see, I took here an example of beautiful drawing on a body in an African tribe. And that was is used as a symbol of identity. So in fact, what the Inuit did here, they had a code that was good against low temperatures, but at the same time was used to as the symbol of identity. Now, when you look at the modern day, um, closets of the, in the Western cultures, you see we still have a coat that is good against low temperatures. But we have more than one coat. And therefore, the other coats we can use for different things. They don't have to be good for low temperatures anymore because we already have one that does that. So you get now that maybe one is better uh, against wind or whatever, and this might not be good for low temperatures and wind at all, but this is more uh, a symbol of identity again. So it is used for a kind of different function. So now seeing this, you can imagine if you are, had an original ice gene that you make duplicates from, and they can have then bec become to do different functions. And our question was now, what was the ancestral function of the ice protein? And we saw it has two different functions, cold acclimation, and uh, the development of somata. So what does it start with? Now to think about that question, you have to think first about evolution of plants. So how did that happen? Initially, algae were living in water. And over time, you got, that you got some organisms that could live in very humid environments, but outside the water. So they had to have some mechanism to protect against a bit more drier conditions. And that became even more important when you go further inland because there there was no high humidity at all. So then you really had to make sure you don't lose too much water and, and uh, don't dry out. And so what happened is that plants develop something that's called a cuticle. And so a cuticle is a hydrophobic layer to prevent drying out. So that is a a thicker layer so that water cannot escape from the plant. But you will have realized by now, the, we, I talked about these stomata, they are important for that gas exchange. But if I put a cuticle on there, what, do, what does that mean? I cannot have any gas exchange anymore. So what you see on these plants is that in the more primitive plants, you get some that have only a fixed opening, so that opening cannot open, cannot uh, close and open, but it's always open. But the rest is the cuticle that, that prevent water loss, so it's already doing a good job of that. And you still have these openings so that you have the gas exchange. 
But in later evolving plants, you can see that there were some, that there were these stomata that I showed you can open and close. And so when people look at it, basically the plants with the fixed opening, that is not really a stoma. So you could say that was like the Neanderthal among the plants that they had one solution, but that was that is not good enough to go to drier ground. These were still surviving. We still have them around because they can still live in human environments. But when you want to go to a bit more drier areas, you need these stomata. And so don't get scared. You don't have to read all this. I just wanted to show you that in the more primitive plants, the all the different proteins that are involved to go from one single cell to become a stomata, it is a relatively simple scheme compared to what these plants have when they are later, uh, the more developed plants, basically. This is a much more complicated scheme. And so what people thought originally is that, aha, plants initially had made this scheme and then they built upon that and they come at the end, you get something complicated like this. But they were wrong. What they found by looking at many different genes, and that is where you might have heard that, that people are, are researchers are sequencing the genome from many different organisms. And what that means is that they look at the uh, genes that are present in the different organisms. And they, they without preconceived notion, you just determine what the sequence is. And then you can ask the question, okay, which genes are among that sequence? So they did that, and the other thing that you can do is to look at the stomata. What do the stomata look like? And this is a fossil of a very ancient plant that doesn't exist anymore, but it, that already looks a bit more complicated. And when people look at all these different genes, this is the proposed model now for how these ancient plants have been um, making their stoma. And so now the idea is that actually these ancient plants were already at this stage. So the plants that we looked at that had the simple stage was actually by reducing the complexity or making it a bit more complex so that you get to the flowering plant. So at the moment, we say that these stomata are already evolved in a very ancestral plant. And then either they became more simple or got lost, or they became more complex. Well, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that the complex stomata were already present in early ancestors. And so now what I did is looking at where in the genome of these plants can I still find sequence that encodes for such an ice protein and the other stomata proteins. And in fact, those proteins could already be made with very, in very primitive plants. What about now the freezing tolerance pathway? There, yes, we use the ice, but we need them to activate CBF, etc. But when I look at genes for that CBF, I can only find it in the genome of these much more developed plants no CBF can be made by any of these plants. That means that really the ice originally was involved uh, in the development of stoma and that the ice CBF pathway for cold tolerance came much later. Now you can still ask, yeah, okay, you say ice, what do you mean? Because we talked earlier about that you have these four different ice proteins in grapes, three of which are quite similar and the fourth one is different. So the, were they already present in the early ancestors or is it that one type arose later? It could be, for example, that I'm just saying now, it could be the ice four, maybe it came later and that is the one that was important for cold tolerance and these are, are uh, more important for the smart development or some of those could be important for woody plants. So the question is really, let's look a little bit deeper into the, the genome of these different plants and find out what kind of ice proteins can they make. And before I show you that, 
These are the same beans that I showed you before. Now the I4 is on top. This is with a certain program that just gives colors to sequences that are the same. And you can see again, the eyes one, two, and three are very similar. And the eyes four is quite different. It's lacking these green boxes and that, that orange box. And this is an easier way to look at when I now look at the genes that are present in the other plants. And that's what you see here. So what you see here on top is many different plants and they all had this ICE4-like protein, that ICE4-type protein, see that? They have the same colors and that are different from the, all the other proteins. So that ICE4-type was present in all these plants. And for example, this one is a very primitive plant. So already in very primitive plants, we have the presence of that ICE4. Also, the other ICE proteins can already be made by very primitive plants. So in basically all types are present in more primitive plants, all the different ice plants. So the idea that maybe one ice was specific for the cold hardiness and another one was more specific for the stomata, that we cannot say anything about based on these results. And so I show you that here in a different way, we basically the all the four different ices were already present in very early plants. And so what is not yet clear, if all types are equally effective for somato development, are equally effective in increasing cold hardiness, and if they specify the small or large stomata, because we saw in the grape that that was a big thing. This we don't know yet, huh? we, but you saw that as the example for the coats, in principle, once you have one that can do one job, then the other ones are free to become something quite different and do a little bit different things. So my suspicion is still that there is a difference in the function between the four and the ice two three at least, maybe also between these that we have to see. To specify small or large stomata, I showed you that now for the uh, grape leaves, but that was only possible by using the scanning electron microscope. And uh, that is not being used uh, by many people that enlarges much more, but it's a bit more work. So often people use a bit less a microscope that can only enlarge to a limited extent in such a way that you cannot see the very small stomata. So at this point in time, we don't know if there are many other plants that have this very small stomata. So what have we seen here? That factors affecting cold hardiness seem the same as those affecting stomata development. The more frost tolerant grapes have a higher number of small sunken stomata. And so the question is, if you can use that by looking at the stomata, can you already predict the cold hardiness of maybe new cultivars. So if you would be thinking about planting, uh, getting a new cultivar, such as was several years ago, planting Syrah in your vineyard, how can you, um, you know, when you plant out a whole vineyard and it doesn't uh, withstand the lower temperatures very well, that can be a problem. So it would be nice to be able to compare it. So the question is, could we use the uh, investigation or the, the analysis of the stomata, can you use that to determine whether it's a good idea or not? And we saw that the ice genes involved with, involved with cold hardiness were likely used in early ancestors for stomata development, not cold hardiness. And you saw that, that CBF was only present in the more, much more evolved plants and not in the more primitive plants. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. So I want to thank the, our different people here. They did more or less uh, uh, were involved with this uh, this project. Of course, I would like to thank Chateau de Charmes and Stratus Vineyard, which allowed me to collect some uh, canes from their property at different months. And I like the different funding agency, which include the Great Growers of Ontario. And uh, I look forward to get some of your questions. Now, see if we can get back into the screen. 
Thank you very much for that very, very interesting uh, uh, talk there. Um, really interesting uh, insight that you're able to bring to this, to this discussion. I'm just having a look. So we do just have a, a, a question here that I'd like to, uh, to direct to you. Um, so the question is, or the first question here is, um, the differences between, and I, I should say, uh, unlike my colleague, uh, Sarah, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a wine expert, so I apologize. I definitely am going to pronounce many things incorrectly here, and I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> um, so so uh, the question from Adrienne, uh, is about the differences between uh, Vitus uh, Riparia uh, and uh, Vitus Vinifera. Uh, so if I'm understanding your lecture properly, they have the same number of uh, um, ice genes. Um, is, is, is it a difference in expression levels uh, that lead to the stomata uh, differences? Um, and uh, are there differences in the uh, promoter region of these genes? Uh, well, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, all of these things are possible. There are some differences, but the question is, of course, if they are important. There are also differences between, minor differences between the protein sequences. So the one protein is slightly different than the other protein, and that might be important. And we haven't determined yet what part of this is, 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 is the thing that makes a difference. So if it is the the uh, change in the protein, the change in the promoters, and uh, that we don't know at this moment. Okay, thank you. Um, and just a, a comment uh, that it's fascinating because there's a clear link in the gene expression uh, between uh, drought stress plant and cold stress plants. Um, and so your, your work, uh, comment again, is that your work is, is linking these uh, traits directly. Um, the evolutionary portion was particularly interesting. Is, uh, is the comment that was. That yeah, was just to say more about the drought stress and, and comparison with, with uh, uh, cold stress. Uh, what is interesting is when you have a freezing event, what you get is that water becomes ice. And when water becomes ice, it's less free water. So the cell experiences that as a drought period. And that is why it is not too surprising to have similar kind of things for, in drought stress and in freezing stress. Okay. Um, now, I don't believe there are any other questions. Uh, I'll just give it uh, one more moment here, um, but I, I don't think we have any other questions. Well, okay. I, I have one, in, one interesting tidbit that has nothing to do with graves, but that interested me. And that was when I was looking at, a, at, a, at an, as an example to look at these codes. Um, the one reason why, why um, the researchers could discover when people started making coats was actually look at lice <laughs> because the lice that are in clothes are different than the lice that are living on people on on organism and so when they try to see the evolution backwards they could based on that they could determine when people had started to make clothes has nothing to do with grape, but I thought it was very interesting that in a roundabout way you can discover something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating the way that uh, that that these sorts of discoveries are made, and and, and this sort sort of history is. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just looking at that. That, for example, when I started looking at when the CBF gene was present, it was a surprise for me to find it only in the higher uh, organisms and not in more primitive plants. I mean. You know, in principle, we thought, okay, that cold acronation, because usually people that work on the cold acronation, they compare different plants, but usually higher plants, because of course, those are the crop plants also, right? So it makes sense. But I mean, when you think back, then you suddenly realize, hey, wait a moment, these more primitive plants don't have that gene. So that means they couldn't be, have been using the ice gene for the cold tolerance in the same, at least not in the same way as the, as the higher plants do. Fascinating. Well, listen, thank you again, uh, Dr. Nasu, for uh, joining us today and uh, uh, to everyone who joined us virtually this afternoon. Um, just a reminder is that uh, this lecture video will be posted shortly to the website at brocku.ca slash ccovi, Covey. 
And uh, you can find more information about the lecture series um, on that website as well. Uh, coming up, uh, Dr. Jim Wilworth of Brock University will be the next speaker uh, in the lecture series. His lecture will take place on a special day, uh, Tuesday, March 23rd at 3 p.m. Um, the lecture topic is the impact of cultivar, clone, and rootstock selection on grapevine cold hardiness. Um, now that week as well, uh, there'll be a second lecture uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Joachim Schultz, also of Brock University, who's going to present on Wednesday, March 24th, so the next day at three o'clock. His lecture, uh, which was originally scheduled for next week and has been rescheduled, um, the lecture topic is augmented reality marketing in the wine industry. Again, two very interesting topics coming up uh, later this month. Um, so we hope that you can join us uh, when we return in a couple of weeks. Um, and with that, we'll say again, thank you very much to Dr. Masuth and uh, thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. -bye.